Welcome to the Powerhouse Talk Show, the show the devil doesn't want you to hear. Listen to powerful scripture insights that will challenge you, reveal warfare strategies, and inspire you to live for God like never before. Now, here's your host and teacher, Sherry Wakeman. Father, I just thank you. I praise you just for this medium that you've given to us to be able to send your word forth, that it can go out through all the ends of the earth. But Father, we just thank you that your word can go out. And as it goes out across these airwaves, that it's penetrating the realm of darkness. Your word says that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. So we ask that as this broadcast goes forth, that the airwaves would be just saturated with your Holy Spirit, with the blood of Jesus, that nothing can stop the transmission or interfere with it. We bind any assignment of the enemy. We cancel it in the name of Jesus. And Father, we just ask for your Holy Spirit to pour himself out on us, to give me the words to speak that you'd have us to speak. And Father, I ask that the ears of the listeners would be open to hear what it is you're speaking to us in this day and in this time, that you just help us to see the things that you've already provided for us, the weapons that you've given for us. And I just ask that the scales that might be blind in any eyes, that those scales would be removed in the name of Jesus, because your word says that, Satan blinds the minds of those who don't believe. So, Father, I ask that you'd open our minds, illuminate them, remove the scales so that we can receive the things that you have for us, because your word says that who you set free is free indeed. So, Father, we just thank you. We praise you for all that you've done and all that you're continuing to do. And I just ask that you take control of the broadcast now. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. When you listen to deliverance ministers, we throw that term around a lot, deliverance, and you'll hear it in different churches, and it means different things. But when you hear us speak about deliverance, we're actually speaking about not just casting out demons. That's a part of it. But deliverance also involves this component of inner healing. So we have inner healing, and then we have the exorcism or the casting out of demons. And honestly, the exorcism or the casting out of demons will get you a lot of attention. But the inner healing is where you get the biggest freedom and the biggest breakthrough. And it can be such an in-depth area to talk about. So I wanted to go into the wounded soul. So anytime I want to teach on the soul area, the first verse I always start with is 1 Thessalonians 5.23. And it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit, your whole soul, your whole body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have a three-part being. That's what sets us apart from the animal kingdom. The animal kingdom was not created in the image and likeness of God. It doesn't have three parts that we have. The next verse would be 3 John 2 that says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you might prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. So God's will for us is complete wholeness, complete healing. Growing up in church, I heard about salvation from the time I was really, really young. But I thought it was just that fire escape from hell. You know, you get saved, you go to heaven when you die in the sweet by and by. But in the meantime, we just suffered. And we never really looked at that verse that God's will is for us to prosper, to be in health. But the health of our body, it's tied back to the health of the soul. As our soul prospers, we prosper physically and every other way. Because we we are so interconnected that the three, the spirit, soul, and body, all affect each other and interact together. So if you look at that, that three-part being, that spirit, and you've heard me say this before if you've listened to me on any of my broadcasts, The fact that we are a spirit being is what allows us to operate in the spirit realm. That's what allows Satan to operate in the spirit realm. That's what allows angels to operate in the spirit realm. Because we are spirit beings, we can also operate in that realm. Ephesians says that we're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. So positionally, we can operate from that third heaven realm because we are a spirit being. The fact that we have a body is what gives us the right or the authority to operate in the physical realm. And we see that principle laid out beginning in the book of Genesis. When God created Adam and Eve, he placed them in the garden. And he said, here, you're to have dominion over the earth, over everything that creeps upon the earth, over everything that swims in the waters. I've given that to you because they were man. He placed them here. They have physical authority and that dominion. That's honestly what when Satan came at Adam and Eve, what he was after. He craves that. But because he's a spirit, he cannot operate here on earth legally without operating through a body, a physical body. But we're also a soul. The soul is usually defined as the mind, the will, and the emotions. But that soul part of us will operate in both realms, both the physical realm and the spirit realm. So it's kind of different from the other two, and it interconnects them. Maybe that's the best way of saying it. 
but the interesting thing is, is because it operates in both realms, God has emotions. The Bible tells us that because that soul area operates in both, whoever controls that soul, the soul part of us, will control basically what we do and which realm we're operating in the most. I mean, at times we want to operate in the spirit realm, but we have so much fear and so much doubt and things cloud in our minds that we operate over here on this carnal side and in the old nature, the carnal nature. So it's really important to know who is in control of that area and to make sure that's submitted to Father God. Well, when you start talking about deliverance and exorcism, the spirit is where the Holy Spirit lives within you if you're a child of God. So at the point of salvation, when you make Jesus Lord of your life, it says that God comes in and we're one with him and he's with us and there's no separation. What that's talking about is the Holy Spirit comes into the spirit man. So that part of us is sealed. But the problem is that Satan is still attacking. And where he's, he attacks, he attacks the body. The Bible t- talks about over and over again how Satan would oppress someone with sickness and with disease. So he would attack there. But the soul is actually the primary target or the primary place because of the way it connects that spirit realm and that physical realm. So if you can control the soul area, he can pull us more back to that carnal realm, that fleshly way of thinking. Or if God is in control, then we're going to operate more in that spirit realm. And that's one of the reasons the Bible tells us to renew our mind, to think on the things that are good and pure and holy and righteous and of good report, to set a guard, a watch over that. That's the reason the Bible tells us we need to submit our wills to Father God. So the condition of your soul is directly connected to your body, your identity, your sense of who you are, your self-worth. It's connected to every relationship you have in life. It's connected to the level of peace you have. Because if Satan can torment your mind, you'll lose that peace. If you have fear and doubt and constant conflict going on inside, then you'll lose your peace. It's connected to your finances. It's connected to your physical health. And it's also connected to the level of dominion you have over demonic power. All of those things. So the more you get healed and delivered in this area of your soul, then the more the battle with the enemy will begin to shift and you'll constantly come out victorious. Because at times it's really hard to rein that flesh back in. But the key to it many, many, many times is here in the soul area and the fact that we have wounds and things that have happened to us in that area. Romans 8 verse 11 says, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the spirit that dwelleth in you. And what that verse is saying is we have the same spirit in us that raised Jesus from the dead. Dunamis power. Dunamis is the root word for dynamite. The power that brought Jesus up out of the grave. It was enough to raise him from the dead. And what Romans is saying, we have that same power within us. And so many times we don't realize what it is we contain or what's in us. We act like we're trodden down. We're beaten down on every hand. Satan's got us under his feet. It's because... We don't understand the principles of warfare that God's given to us, the weapons that he's provided for us. The Bible says our weapons are mighty in him to the pulling down of strongholds, but they don't work if we don't use them or if we don't know what they are. Like Hosea 4, 6 says, my people perish for lack of knowledge because you don't know who you are. You will be defeated. If you don't know your enemy, you will be defeated over and over. 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, If any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So at the point of salvation, it says we become a new creature, a new creation. The Spirit of God comes with inside us. You know, growing up in church, we used to almost interpret that as being, we've been saved, now we're going to heaven. We didn't see ourselves as being made brand new. It was like, well, God took the old and he just dressed it up and cleaned it up. And here we are, and now we've, you know, kind of got to figure it out the rest of the way. But that's not what that scripture actually says. It says, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creature, a new creation, a new species of being, something that has not existed before. So God doesn't take the old us and just kind of polish us up, but he makes all things new. But we've got to allow him to do the work in us. Our spirit man is born again, because before the point of salvation, that spirit man, the Bible says, was dead to Christ. It was dead in sin. Now it's alive, but we've got to get to the place we allow that spirit man to become even bigger inside of us. There's times when I pray or when I'm speaking and declaring things over myself, that's one of the things I'll say. Spirit man, I need you to rise up to take ascendancy because the flesh is not in control. It wants to be. 
It tries to be at times. The soul wants to be in control. You get hit with the fear and the doubt and everything else, and it's like, no. The Bible says to pull down the strongholds. Well, those strongholds are just mindsets. They're things that have been programmed into the mind that are contrary to the Word of God. From the time you're a small child, things are fed into you over and over and over again, and you don't question them because you're a kid and the adults are telling you, and there's just this thing that you trust the adults, you trust what you're being told. And you don't realize until later, and when you start looking at the scripture, that, hey, these things don't line up. Well, those things have been in in there sometimes and embedded so deeply, but now they've got to be rooted up. They've got to be brought to the light of the gospel to see if they measure up. And if not, God may have to deal with them. And so when we talk about inner healing, basically just a quick definition of inner healing would be a supernatural restoration of the earliest and deepest wounds of the soul. That would be inner healing. So there's a supernatural component to it, the inner healing. You've got to have a supernatural intervention with Father God. Restoration, that's restoring it to a condition as if the damage had never been done. Not just cleaning it up and polishing it up, sending you on the way, but restoring you back. The salvation from God is a whole person's salvation. He doesn't just do part of it and then he's done. With God, salvation, that wholeness, sows it. It's the whole person. And then I've got earliest and deepest wounds. If you think about it, the worst trauma is usually at the earliest stages of development as a child. A basic personality is formed at a very young age as a preschooler. Some people will say before the age of, you know, three or four years old. And after that, it's just kind of layered in. But the more innocent you are or the younger you are, then a lot of times the deeper the wound is. Yet we can go through trauma and things later and it just adds to it. But a lot of times there's some deep hidden wounds that have been there from the very, very beginning. And sometimes you may not even know what they are or where they came from. They're just there. And it's been there so long, it seems like it's just a part of you. But during life, all of us have experienced situations or circumstances that have deeply wounded that soul area of us. And when you think about it, that soul controls every part of you. I mentioned the identity. It controls the way you think about yourself. It controls the way you see others. Because you always see yourself through that wounded. If you've got a parent that constantly tells the child that they're not good enough, they're never going to measure up, they're never going to amount to anything, that's how the child sees themselves, always through that lens, always through those glasses. When it looks at it, the child never expects to measure up. If somebody else gets picked over them, it's like, well, I wasn't good enough to start with because that's the lens through which they see everything. So the soul will control that. It will control the emotions. Paul even said in in Romans, he said, now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. It's that soul part of me. You know, I want to do the right thing. I want to go this way. But there's a part of me that pulls me back to go the other way. Living a holy, righteous life, you've got to get those soul wounds healed. Because otherwise, you talk to people, you try to minister to people, you try to prophesy to people, and you'll do it out of that woundedness. So if you think about it, how do you know if you have those soul wounds? What would that look like? Well, some possibilities are nothing ever seems to get fixed. It seems like everything's always going wrong and nothing's ever fixed. Or there could be portions of your memory that are missing because of denial or dissociation. You could have problems with relationships where they're difficult or dysfunctional. You could have self-abusive behavior patterns that are repeated over and over again. A lot of times if you have people that are caught up into like drugs and alcohol, overeating, those things are like a tendency to self-medicate, to medicate that wound. And they may not even realize why they do it or what they're doing. But it's an attempt to either punish them because they deserve it or to medicate so they don't feel the immediate pain. It takes their mind off of what's going on at that very moment. And if you want an example from Scripture of what it looks like, you can go to the book of Job. And in chapter 12, verses 1 to 2, Job actually says this. He says, I'm disgusted with my life, and I loathe it. I will give free expression to my complaint. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. I will say to God, do not condemn me and declare me guilty. Show me why you contend and argue and struggle with me. So what's he saying? I'm disgusted. I hate my life. Well, if you look around you, we deal with people every day that are suicidal, that have depression. And it's not unusual to see that among Christians even. That doesn't make them bad, horrible people. We're all in this battle. We all fight different battles at times. We have different weak points. But if we have these wounds in our soul that aren't healed, 
is going to come out with things like that. You get to the point you're lashing out at your friends due to events that are going on, and it may have nothing to do with the current situation. It's just the fact that they've triggered it. They've reminded you of it. They've opened that door again. And when you lash out, you're lashing out at them because they're right there and they open the door. But the emotions and things behind it are compiled from all the past hurt and from all the past trauma. So when it comes out, it just comes out like a flood. And it's over and above what the actual situation warrants. You can be in a position where you're questioning God, why he's doing this to you. Why does he allowing these things to happen? All of that comes out of that woundedness of the soul. On the other hand, if you think about what would healing or wholeness look like? Well, if you go to the book of Acts, in chapter 4, it says that the company of the believers were of the same heart and the same soul. Their souls, their spirits were all knitted together as one in love. And what they were doing is because of that unity that they had, you read the book of Acts over and over again, it will use that phrasing. They were together of one accord. Of one accord, they're in the upper room. Of one accord, they were doing this. and one accord, they were doing that. There was no strife. There was no division. Well, because they were on the same page and their spirits and their hearts and their souls were knit together as one, they were seeing healings. They were seeing miracles. God was able to move supernaturally. They weren't responding to each other out of that woundedness of the soul. Let's back up for just a second and think about how do we get these soul wounds? We may have them. We may know they're there, but how did we get them? Well, they come in by usually three different ways. One, due to sin. Second Peter 2.8, for that righteous man, and this is referring to Lot, living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. Lot was Abraham's nephew. And the Bible says he was a righteous man. He knew right from wrong. He knew to do the sacrifices, looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. He knew to pray to God and, and to worship the one true God, but he chose instead the easy life. Let's move to Sodom. Let's move to Gomorrah. And what the Bible says is he would see the things that were going on around him, just lawlessness. If you ever go back and study some of what was going on, it, there was just some horrible things taking place. And it said it vexed his soul to see it, the sin and stuff. And even when he spoke to his family, they would laugh at him. They wouldn't listen. And he got caught up in a lot of it. But because he had that righteousness at one point, that right relationship with God, it vexed him because he knew it wasn't right. You think about it, when you fall into sin, the Holy Spirit convicts and draws us back again and again and again. But if we ignore that conviction, then we can become hardened to sin. But that allows a wound to come in, a separation between us and Father God. Wounds are also formed, and this is a big one, when someone sins against you. It can be either intentional or accidental. But somebody does something against you, they come against you, they hurt you, they wound you. And when I mentioned earlier, the earliest and deepest wounds, especially if it's a person that's in authority over you, like a parent over a child, it can do some deep hurt and some deep trauma. If the parent rejects that child and there's a spirit of rejection, the parent doesn't want that child, there will be a wounding deep in that child because of that. The parent might not have realized at that time what they were doing to the child, but it still caused that hurt that the child holds inside of them. And a lot of us have that, the pain and the rejection from mom and dad. The parent didn't want us or they divorced and the kid somehow blames themselves. There's a wounding there in the soul. You also see it as very intentional if you get into any of the satanic groups or any of the cults. They will do an intentional trauma to divide the soul person. They want to divide it and compartmentalize it into the altar system. That one would be very intentional with what they're doing. And then you also see it, like I mentioned if somebody over them, there's a pain by proxy or a generational curse, a bunch of different terminologies you can use. But basically, somebody that has a power of spiritual authority over you sins, and because there's your spiritual covering and they mess up, it filters down to the child. It filters down to the people that they're covering. And you go through scripture and look, there's example after example of when things like this happen. If you go to the book of Genesis, when Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, they're going across the desert. They're in the wilderness 40 years. Well, there's a group of men that decide, you know what? We're priests too. How dare Moses think that he's the only one that God talks to. God speaks to us too. So they actually stood up against Moses and God said, I'll deal with them. And he said, okay, everybody separate from them. 
So when they did, Cora and his two friends are there, and it said all their families are there, all their children, their livestock, the animals. And once the other people separated from them, the earth opened up and swallowed them all down to the pit. It didn't just swallow the men. Their families were affected as well. In the story of David, when David looked on Bathsheba and saw Bathsheba and he slept with her and she conceives a child, when God sent his prophet to tell David, because of this sin, this is what's going to happen. David's children were not spared because David was the spiritual covering, the spiritual protection over that family. So when he sins, that leaves them wide open to the enemy. A lot of times when Satan tempts us to sin, it's not always about us. It may be about our children. It may be about our grandchildren. It may be about somebody that's connected to us that if we mess up, it's going to affect them. If you think about it, when we see a pastor or a spiritual leader who falls into sin or to temptation and they fall, there's a ripple effect. It affects the people underneath them. That's what this is talking about. So there's several ways that this can come. The generational sin, if there's wounds and things that happen, Due to a generational sin, there's been some studies done along this line, that, which are really fascinating if you have time to go run them. And I don't want to chase this rabbit too long, but the term is epigenetics. And if you look at what the study of epigenetics has shown, what they actually did is they did a small study on a small group. It was like 30 some Jewish men and women that had been subject to the Holocaust with the Nazis. And they went in and did a study to see what that did to their DNA and how it changed their DNA. And what they found is there's a gene that it actually changed some of the tags with it. So some of the triggers and things with the genes and those genes then passed down to the children. Well, when they did the study, they found that the children were more liable or more susceptible to depression, to the stress, to the anxiety and to some of these things than what the parents were who went through the actual trauma because of what was passed down genetically. I mean, fascinating study if you've got time to go and look at it. There's been a couple others along the same line. But it's talking about what that does to us at a genetic level when there is trauma, when there is abuse, and how it can change the genes, and then we pass those on to our kids. So without even knowing it, they have this tendency or this weakness. Growing up, I had a friend I was really close to in high school. And we went to school up till about my junior year, and then she got sent to another school. And we kind of lost contact for several years while I went away to college. When I came back from college, I reconnected with the family. And when I reconnected with the family, they would say that she got in with a bad crowd because she had gotten out. She was doing drugs. She was drinking, things like that. And that stuff was very much against the rules, the way we were raised. It wasn't there in the school. It wasn't tolerated. It wasn't allowed. It gets you kicked out quicker than anything. But now that she's out of school, she had gotten in with this crowd. And I remember her parents saying things like, you're just like your grandmother, just like your grandmother. Turned out she had a grandmother who was an alcoholic and had gotten into a lot of things along that line. So when my friend passed away, she actually died at 34, hepatitis C, cirrhosis of the liver exact same way her grandmother had died. And I was just sitting back watching this because a lot of what the word says was new to me. I was just getting to the point I was really digging in and studying it. And I thought, man, they're confessing that over to her. They're speaking that over their daughter. And they were. But in addition to what they were speaking, genetically, there was probably a tendency or a weakness towards that alcohol that was in the family line. So their words were just lining up exactly with what was already there. You know, we all have different battles we face. We all have different things that we struggle with. Every family has different things. They're not all the same. But what Satan is doing is those things are passing down through the bloodlines. And as they do, Satan knows what traps to lay, what triggers to place. You got to remember, he's been at this a long, long time. He's had a couple of thousand years to perfect his game. So he would have known the grandmother was an alcoholic. So it's like, okay, that's probably where the weakness is. Let's set that temptation out there. Let's put that trap there and see if we'll open that door. And with that stuff being passed down genetically, there's a weakness to it. So if those things are not healed and submitted to Father God, there's a real danger there of Satan being able to do that, to lay that kind of a trap for us. So wounds will just give the demonic powers the right to torment you. It's like they give the demonic this legal right. Psalm 143.3. 
For the enemy has persecuted me. He has crushed my life down to the ground. He has made me dwell in dark places like those who have been long dead. That's what Satan is after. John 10.10 10 says the thief comes but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That is Satan's agenda. But God sent Jesus that we might have life and life more abundantly to the full, till it overflows, direct opposite. But it's up to us what we do with it. Because when God sent Jesus, he paid the price for us to be able to have that complete wholeness and that complete healing. But he doesn't force it on us. And honestly, when you start dealing with wounds of the soul, it can be very painful. It's not a fun process because we want to go out for revenge. We don't want to go, Father, they wronged me. I need to forgive them. That's usually the furthest thing from our mind. We want to hold on to that. We want to go after people. So it's really important that we know what these wounds look like and what they can do to us. Because I used to wonder, when Jesus came to the earth, the Bible tells us that he laid aside his power, his Godhead, and he came to earth as a man, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit so he could be our example. If he came to earth and did all the miracles he did as God, then we couldn't do them. But he didn't. He clearly says that the things he did, we can do, and even greater things, because he's already gone back to the Father. So I used to always wonder, why were the demons subject to Jesus even before he went to the cross then? I mean, there's no sin in him, right? But the demons knew who he was, and they listened to him, and they obeyed even before he went to the cross. He had dominion. But you stop and look at it in light of this, the soul wounds. There was no soul wounds in Jesus. He didn't have the earthly father to pass the sin to him. The Bible says, for, for us by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. But in Jesus' case, the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. So the baby was conceived in her was of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus didn't have that sin nature. It was not inherited in him. And as he's on earth, he's tempted like we are, but yet he doesn't fall into the temptation. He doesn't allow those soul wounds to come into him. So if you think about it, he has dominion, but he doesn't have the sin. We have some verses that talk about that actually in the New Testament. John 14, verse 30, in the King James says, Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. If I go to the Amplified, that same verse says, I will not speak with you much longer, for the ruler of the world, Satan, is coming, and he has no claim on me, no power over me, nor anything that he can use against me. What's that saying? It's saying, you know, Jesus is saying, Satan is coming after me, but there's nothing in me he can attach. There are no soul wounds in me that he can latch onto, that he can use. Because if I have a soul wound in me, then don't you think that's seen in the spirit realm? You think about it. The Bible teaches that the righteousness of Christ is our cloak or our clothing, our covering in the spirit realm. If you go to the book of Revelations, it talks about it to a great extent. We'll just put it that way. But it's like we're clothed with this righteousness of God, this pure, this white, holy garment, because there's no spot, there's no wrinkle, there's no shadow of anything in Jesus. And as long as we're in him and we're covered and our sins are forgiven, the Bible says when we confess our sins, they're cleansed, they're washed. The Bible says God makes us whiter than snow. Well, what is that? That is our covering or our clothing in the spirit realm. But when we have sin, when we have soul wounds, because when somebody hurts you, then if you react in anger or in bitterness, that begins to fester that. And that begins to show up in the spirit realm. And the Bible talks about it looking like dirty garments or dirty clothes. There's spots, there's wrinkles. And that shows up in the spirit realm. So here when Satan, Jesus is saying, Satan's coming after me. But here's the thing. There's nothing in me. There's nothing he can attach. There's no soul wounds. There's no opening for him. And we really have a picture of this playing out if you go to Mark chapter 5. And I think most of us are probably familiar with this story, but it's the story of the man with the spirit of legion. And I'm going to read this one out of the Amplified. It says, They came to the other side of the sea, to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And the man lived in the tombs, and no man could bind him any more, not even with chains. For he had often been bound with shackles for the feet and with chains, and he tore apart the chains and broke the shackles into pieces. And no one was strong enough to subdue and tame him. Night and day he was constantly screaming and shrieking among the tombs and on the mountains. 
and cutting himself with sharp stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him in homage. And screaming with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have in common with each other? Jesus, Son of the Most High God, I implore you by God, swear to me, do not torment me. Did you catch what the guy said when he saw Jesus? He ran up to Jesus, and it's like when you meet somebody in a crowd or when you step into a place, it's like the demons in them send out their little demon antennas, do 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 and they're looking for that place in you. They're looking for what they have in common with you that they can attach to. When you walk into a place as a son or daughter of God with the anointing of the Holy Spirit in you, there should be something in your spirit that speaks to the spirit of the other Christians in that place. So your spirits come together as one. There's a unity of the faith. There's the same thing on the demonic side. If you take like 100 kids, 100 teenagers, put them all in the room, in, a, in one big room together, if you have two kids that are rebellious, they will find each other before the night's up. And you know how they do it. It's not by asking around, but it's the spirit within them that draws. And that's exactly what this man with the spirit of legion happened. You know, Jesus steps out and the demons in him, they're looking. Is there any place in him? Is there anything that we have in common with him? Is there any place in him that we can latch on to, that we can attach? Because if there's any opening in him, that's going to limit any power or authority he has over those demons because they will see that in him. That's why the temptation when Jesus was driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit and tempted of Satan, that's why that is so, so important because Satan is coming at him. He's throwing temptation after temptation. The Bible records those three, but it doesn't say it was just three. It says he was in the wilderness for 40 days and tempted of the devil. So for 40 days, Satan is going after him. And Satan's waiting because, you know, he's fasting, he's praying, he's in this weakened state. That's when Satan comes. And Satan offers him all the kingdoms of the world. If you'll bow down and worship me, everybody will be under you but me. You can have a shortcut to the cross. And Jesus says, get thee behind me. No way, Satan. The word of God says. And over and over, Jesus went back to the word. It is written, it is written, it is written. And finally, the Bible says Satan left him for a more convenient time. But if you think about it, there's no wounds in Jesus. And because when Satan comes at him with his best shot and cannot get him to bow his knee to Satan, doesn't fall for those temptations, Jesus now has spiritual power and authority over Satan everywhere he goes. And those demons are under Satan's control and under Satan's power. So they recognize that when they come, there's nothing in him. There's no place in him. He's got spiritual power. He's got spiritual authority. He's already defeated their head. And because he's already defeated Satan, they don't have anything left to come against him. When he steps foot, it's like they come immediately. You've got to see that. Immediately, they're like right there. And they recognize the power and authority that he walks in. And they're begging him. There's nothing in common. Don't torment us. Because he's got power and authority over them. They have nothing on him. That's why it's so important that we live lives that are holy that are righteous, that are consecrated, that are set apart before Father God. You know, sometimes we want to think we can sneak around and do things and the preacher won't see us or the brother or sister or whoever won't see us, but we forget. God sees all, knows all, hears all. And not only does God see it and know it, the angels see it, the demons see it, it's clearly known in the spirit realm. But Jesus didn't have that stuff in him. So that's what Legion's saying, don't torment me before the time. Swear to me you won't. And the interesting thing to me with this passage, it's like this guy had all these demons in him. And even though he had all these demons, those demons were not enough to keep him from coming to Jesus. And the Bible gives us a very clear picture of the torment this guy lived in. And you can see it. He's got soul wounds in there, but it talks about it. He's living in the tombs. Think about it. If you go visit the cemetery, we've got headstones. What is that? Those are set up as perpetual reminders for us of people that have lived and died. The tombstones, it's a perpetual reminder of past events. It's like that record player that plays over and over and over in your mind and never lets you move on and never lets you forget and never lets you forget what that person did to you and never lets you loose from this action or what, that, what was spoken into you. Those are tombstones. And that's what this guy lived among. He lived among the dead, the constant reminders of the past. And he's in torment. The Bible talks about how he's cutting himself. That's typically a sign of somebody who's dissociative. They're cutting themselves. He's shrieking. He's crying out. He's in actual torment because he has wounds from the past. 
When you're healed, when you're delivered, you've got a new level of dominion over these demonic spirits. These soul wounds don't keep tormenting you like that. You're not shrieking. You're not crying out. You're not losing sleep. You're, it's not constantly replaying in your mind. I'm not saying that when you're healed that you completely forget them. You don't, but they don't have that same hold on you. Now you can take and use some of the things that you've been through from the past to be able to minister to other people, to maybe be able to minister to someone that's in that situation, to be able to pull them out of the torment that they're living in. The Bible tells us that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. That doesn't mean that God put his stamp of approval on the sin. It doesn't mean God put his stamp of approval on the wounds or the trauma or the abuse that you've been through. But what it does mean is God will take those things, even as ugly as they are, turn them around and use them for his honor and for his glory. The very thing that Satan is trying to use to destroy you, God will use to make you a vessel of honor. That's what that's referring to. So when you're healed, you actually begin to make your decisions out of wholeness instead of out of that fear and that torment. Whole different picture of what God has for us versus what Satan has for us. And Mark tells us later on, he said, when they came to Jesus, they saw the man, the one that had been possessed. He's sitting at Jesus' feet. He's clothed in his right mind. Before, there were no clothes. They couldn't bind him. They couldn't do anything with him. But now he's in his right mind because the demons are gone. Well, the mind, it's a part of that soul area. So he got healed. When he's healed, that right mind is a sound mind. He was cured. He's healed of his physical diseases. So if you have an attack that's coming at you or things that are replaying over in your mind, look for what's in common with them in that area. What are the soul wounds you need healing? If there aren't any soul wounds, then you have dominion over it. I remember one time when I really got a picture of this. You know, God allows some things to teach us at times, some things that happen. I was ministering in another town a couple hours from where I lived at the time. And I would do a Bible study about once a month. And I had been teaching. And at the end of the teaching, we would always have a time of prayer. So the first woman that came up for prayer, when I went to pray for her, I went to lay hands on her. What it felt like is it felt like that claw had just reached into my stomach or my gut and just grabbed hold of it, just like in a vice grip. And it was just twisting first one way and then the other. And I'm like doubled over because I can physically feel this. I don't immediately recognize that this is a spiritual attack. I start going through my mind, checking off, what did I eat today? Did I eat anything? No, I haven't eaten in several hours. I've been ministering. I typically didn't eat before I minister, so I'm checking it off. and I'm going, no, this isn't physical. This is spiritual. And I'm like doubled over. So I have to step out and put somebody else in because I can't pray. I can't minister. This thing has completely shut me down. And I don't even know why yet. So I had the lady who would assist me and act as my driver, I had her step in and pray. And I'm doubled over leaning against the wall. But as I am, I'm listening to what she's ministering to this person. And as she was ministering, she began to minister on sexual abuse in the family line. And it was just like this light bulb went off because I knew there was a bunch of that in my family line. Not in me necessarily, but throughout my family, it was there, especially in the male members of the family. So I realized why that thing could attach me, because what God was saying is there's some things in me that's got to be dealt with. So that thing was allowed to get a hold of me and shut me down to the point I could not minister to this person. Thank God there was other people there who could. But as soon as I left that meeting, I was like, OK, I got to have deliverance now because I've got to get this dealt with. I can't have this thing able to attack me and shut me down like this. And that's what Satan wants to do and will do at times. But for me, it was a very real example of what this is talking about because there was some soul wounds in there. Even though I wasn't the abuser, I'd seen the effects of it in siblings. I'd seen the effects with other family members. I knew what was going on and what had happened. And it's like, okay, I've got to deal with it. I've got to walk through it, the forgiveness and stuff. But because that was there, I couldn't minister. And that's what Satan wants. He wants to be able to shut us down, to lock us down to where we're paralyzed and just can't. So if we've got soul wounds, what do we do about it? Well, thank God that he's already provided a way of escape. The Bible says that with every temptation, there's always a way of escape. In my case, when this thing shut me down like that, I knew what it was. I knew what was being pinpointed, but you've got to go back to the point of the pain. I remember when I first got around deliverance people and they would talk about that, I would be like, you know what, I don't feel anything. 
I'm not holding any unforgiveness against this person because, you know, if I was, I would know it, right? Well, not necessarily. I thought that until I heard a man of God get up and teach, and he said, you know what? If that person is never guilty, then you didn't forgive them because they were never guilty of anything to forgive. And once again, that light bulb kind of went on because I realized that as a child growing up in an abusive home environment where I saw things that I should not have seen, where I saw the physical abuse, where I was aware of the sexual abuse, but I had one parent that was the abuser, but I had the other one that was always excusing the abuse, going, you got to understand how this person was raised. You got to understand why they're that way. And because they were that way and always excusing the sin and always excusing the abuse and kind of sweeping it under the carpet, I grew up thinking this was just normal because that's what I knew. And if I really understood where that person's coming from, then I wouldn't be upset with them and I wouldn't blame them. So in my mind, they were never guilty. So when you get me into deliverance or into counseling, I'd be like, yeah, I'm not holding any unforgiveness because I just didn't feel anything because I had shut those emotions down, locked them down to the point I wasn't even aware of them. And that's what they were saying. You got to go back to that point where the pain was and the person has to be guilty long enough for me to be able to forgive them. You can't go to court and get forgiveness if you're never guilty. There's nothing to pardon. And I was like, wow, that made a whole lot of sense. I get it. I'm not saying they're guilty so I can hold unforgiveness against them so I can exact my revenge. But what they did was wrong. So I'm acknowledging that instead of sweeping it under the carpet and excusing it. Because before God, it's sin. We tend to excuse our sin and a lot of times everybody else's sin instead of calling it exactly what God says it is. Sin is sin. So you go to the point of that pain. You don't believe the lie that it's over and you just forget it and move on. But you go to the point of the pain. And sometimes you got to say, Father God, as best I can, I choose to forgive this person. I'm going to have to say it in faith because I'm not there yet. And sometimes the feelings have to catch up later. But I'm going to turn over to you the right for revenge, the right to deal with this person. Because the word says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And when I get in there and try to exact the revenge myself, guess what? I'm taking it out of God's hands. I'm making myself God in that situation instead of allowing God to deal with that person. Because you think about it, none of us are perfect. None of us get everything exactly right. So when it comes to us, we want mercy. We don't want justice. It's like, oh, God, have mercy on me. Don't judge me according to my sin, but get my brother. See, that's not the way God moves and operates. God has mercy on them also. But the Bible says, whoever sins I retain, they retain. Whoever I forgive, they're forgiven. So if that person's guilty, I want to speak forgiveness. I want to give the Holy Spirit the right to move on that person, to convict that person, to be able to save that person, to change that person, to do the work in that person that he's done in me. I don't want to constantly hold the unforgiveness and reminding them of what they did and how bad they are. No, I've got to turn loose of that and pray for that person. Isn't that what Jesus said? He said, we're to pray for our enemies, pray for those who despitefully use us and persecute us. You think about it, if Jesus had held things against people when he was on the cross, he wouldn't have been speaking out forgiveness. In heaven, the blood has a voice and his blood is crying out for our forgiveness. He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. What is it we are crying out in the spirit realm for these people? Are we crying out and asking for their forgiveness? So you go to that point of the pain. But you're going, God, help me to see it through your eyes. Help me to see it as you see it. Help me to see where you were in this situation. Because I realized as I started to work through some of this with myself that sometimes the problem was the fact I was holding a grudge against God for even allowing it. So sometimes I had to say, okay, God, show me where you were at in this situation. What were you doing when this abuse was taking place? So you may have to go back and revisit it, not to hold on to it, not to dwell in it, not to stay there, not to set up the tombstones like the man with the spirit of legion, but to be able to work through it with the Holy Spirit or with a counselor or with a pastor, to be able to come out on the other side where you can get the forgiveness because you want to turn that over to Father God. That's really God's heart for you and what he has for us. But if we hold on to those wounds, if we hold on to that trauma, If we hold on to that past, we're always going to be right there. Never moving, stuck, you know, like mired down in the sand. And that's not what God has for us. 
But what God has for us is so much different than sometimes what we think. Those things may be there, but if we can move through them, if we can bring them to Father God, if we can work through them and receive the forgiveness for ourselves and for that other person, then guess what? You have power and you have authority over that thing now in the spirit realm. So when you go to minister to somebody, when you go to pray for somebody, then you will pray different. You will pray with different authority because you've now worked through this. And I've seen that happen when God, a lot of times, if I was getting ready to minister on a topic or on a subject, or if I was going to help someone else in a meeting, a lot of times God would bring up things in me that had to be dealt with. And I didn't always understand why, but God's got a perfect timing. He's got a reason why he does things. And as he would bring things up in me to be dealt with, and I would deal with them, then I would go and be in a service, and all of a sudden I'm ministering to somebody, and I recognize the same thing in them that I just dealt with. And I can recognize it, and that thing doesn't attack me and shut me down now because it's been dealt with. And because I've dealt with it, I have power and authority over that spirit. I have power and authority over that thing that's tormenting that person. So when I speak and when I pray, I do it totally differently than someone who's never dealt with it. Because now my spirit empathizes with their spirit. It's like the Bible says that we have a high priest who's touched with the feelings of our infirmity because he was tempted in all points like us we are. He knows what it is to be human. He knows what it is to go through this stuff. And because he knows, he's the one that's our high priest that pleads our case in the heavens. And when I minister to somebody and I minister in what I've already gone through, I know what that torment feels like. I know what that feeling of despair feels like. And I also know how to bind it and break it and cast it out and get rid of it and minister healing to the person. You know, God has so much for us. So much for us. He, there's a place that he wants to take us to where his spirit can be poured out. But it's not going to happen until we deal with the stuff that's in us, these soul wounds. And God will bring them up at different times. He's not going to bring everything up at once. As God begins to bring things up, allow him to deal with them. Know that it won't be comfortable. It won't be a fun process. But when he brings them up, do the self-examination. What is it in the past that God's trying to deal with? What wound is it he wants to heal? Because as he heals that, I can minister even more powerful. His spirit can flow through me even stronger than it's flowed through me in the past. Thank God he's got so much for us. Father, we just thank you for your word that you've given to us. Father, sometimes it's such a simple thing, but it's so powerful. It's mighty. So, Father, just give us ears to hear what it is your spirit spoke to us. The things that the spirit brought up in us. Father, just give us the strength to be able to deal with them. The wisdom and the knowledge. Your word says that if we lack that wisdom, to ask of you and you'll give it. So, Father, we thank you for your convicting Holy Spirit. We thank you for opening and illuminating our minds. And, Father, we just ask for a protection and for a covering. Because we know Satan comes immediately to steal that word, to take away the things that your spirit has spoken. So we ask for that covering and protection, that he would not be able to steal this word but that this word would go forth and that it would bring forth fruit, just as your word says. And we thank you and we praise you. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Powerhouse Talk Show. Tune in next week for another powerful teaching from the word of God. Every Saturday at 5 a.m., 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Central Standard Time with your host and teacher, Sherry Wakeman. This is the show the devil doesn't want you to hear. Until then, remember, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. Be sure to share the podcast on your favorite social media channel.